Hey, Stargazers, welcome back. My name is Nick. I'm a theaters manager at the Adler Planetarium, and you're watching Skywatch Wednesday. Well, this episode, we're diving into the ecliptic, the plane of our solar system. It's the place to look for your favorite planets and the moon, and also home to some of the most famous constellations in the sky. So let's take a look. We're going to start off looking high in the southern sky tonight, about 90 minutes after sunset. Now, about two thirds of the way up is the bright star Regulus, the brightest star in Leo the Lion. It marks the base of a backwards question mark in the sky, sometimes called the sickle of Leo. Trailing back behind this are the back legs and the tail, which is marked by the star Denebola. Now, there are several stars in the sky with names that include Deneb, a word originating from the Arabic word for tail. I've talked many times about the star called Deneb, the tail of Cygnus, the swan. That's part of the summer triangle. Denebola marks the tail of Leo. Deneb Kytos, better known as Difta, marks the tail of Cetus, the sea monster. And Deneb El Jedi is the tail of Capricornus, the sea goat. So as hard as some of these constellations can be to trace out, sometimes the names of the stars are giving us hints about what to look for. The constellation of Leo is one of the oldest in the sky. Archaeological evidence points to ancient Mesopotamians recognizing a lion in the stars as early as 4000 BCE. The Persians, Syrians, Babylonians, Turks, and many other cultures all had names for this grouping of stars that mean lion. Ptolemy recorded Leo as a constellation in the second century, and the Greeks associated it with the Nemean lion, one of the trials of Hercules. Leo is fairly bright, and Regulus can be seen easily even from the most light-polluted skies, but a good trick to find Leo is to use the Big Dipper. If you imagine that you fill the bowl of the Dipper with water, and then poke a hole in the bottom, the water will drip onto the back of Leo. The star Regulus, marking the heart of Leo, is the closest bright star to the ecliptic, or the plane of our solar system. This line in the sky is the path that the sun appears to move along as the Earth orbits around it. Throughout the year, the sun appears to move through the constellations that lie along this line. In modern astronomy, these constellations are all different sizes, and the length of time the sun spends in them is uneven. When the non-scientific practice of astrology arose, the stars along the ecliptic, known as the zodiac, were split up into 12 equally sized signs. And this is the origin of the dates you might be familiar with if you read your horoscope. Part of the reason those dates don't always match up with where the sun actually is in the constellations is that the modern constellation boundaries don't match the equally sized signs of astrology. Another reason is that over thousands of years, a slow process called precession has occurred, slowly changing where the poles of the Earth point, and also the dates when the sun is in certain constellations. For instance, if your sign is Leo, your birthday is between July 23rd and August 21st. But the sun is within the official constellation boundaries of Leo from August 10th to September 15th. Now, either way, it isn't recommended to try to see your sign or constellation on your birthday. That's when the sun is in or near it in the sky. The best time to look are the months opposite your birthday. That's when the constellation will be up mainly at night. The ecliptic is also the area of the sky where the planets and the moon appear. So, for instance, you'll never see a full moon in, say, the bowl of the Big Dipper. You'll always see the moon near the ecliptic in the sky. You can watch the moon make its way across the evening zodiac signs over the next couple of weeks. Tonight, the moon is near the Pleiades star cluster in Taurus the Bull. And tomorrow night, it'll be right near the V-shape of stars that make up the face of the bull. The next night, on Friday, it'll be between the horns of Taurus and below the planet Mars. And the following night, it will have leapfrogged above Mars. In fact, for observers in much of Southeast Asia, the moon will briefly occult the red planet, blocking Mars from view. On the night of the 18th, the moon is in Gemini, below Pollux and Castor. And on the night of the 19th, it will make a roughly straight line with those two stars. By next Wednesday, the moon will be in Leo, just in front of the sickle. And on the 25th, the nearly full moon will shine near the bright star Spica in the next constellation along the ecliptic, Virgo the Maiden. Virgo is quite a large constellation. In fact, it is the second largest by area 
second only to Hydra, which I talked about in the last episode. Regarding uneven sizes of the Zodiac constellations, the Sun takes 44 days to pass through Virgo, compared to spending only 7 days in the constellation of Scorpius. For Greek astronomers, this constellation was associated with Demeter, their goddess of wheat and agriculture, known as Ceres to the Romans. This association with grain and fertility dates back much farther. For the ancient Babylonians, part of this constellation represented a furrow, a trench made in the ground for planting seeds, which was symbolic of the goddess Shala and an ear of grain. Many depictions of Virgo continue this tradition. She's often shown holding grain in one hand. The name of Virgo's brightest star, Spica, is Latin for ear of grain. Well, we use the Big Dipper to find Leo, and we can also use it to find Spica in Virgo. Using the handle of the Big Dipper, continue that arc shape, first to the bright star Arcturus, and then continue to speed on to Spica, or drive a spike to Spica. The boundaries of the constellation of Virgo contain a famous cluster of galaxies, the Virgo Galaxy Cluster. One of the galaxies in this cluster, known as M87, is the host galaxy of the famous black hole that was imaged with the Event Horizon Telescope. So I encourage you to get out there this week and see how many constellations along the ecliptic you can spot. Getting familiar with these constellations allows you to watch the dance of the sun, the moon, and the planets throughout the year. Well, that's what we have for you this time. Thanks, as always, for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to Adler's YouTube channel and also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Happy stargazing, and we'll see you next time.